this is a great honor for me. And mainly because I already said I'm a lifetime Terp. My dad was a Terp. He started taking me to basketball games back in the McMillan, Elmore, Lucas, Mo Howard era. I graduated in 1981. I worked in the athletic department in 80 and 81, and I worked for Lefty, Jim Kehoe, Jerry Claiborne, and I've been a season ticket holder since 1995. And since we moved to Comcast, I always see Walt coming down with <laughs> Coach Turgeon, arm in arm, headlock, whatever. <laughs> He's trying to get back to the locker room. But mainly, ever since I went to the Capitol Classic, back in the early 80s, I saw a young gentleman from Northwestern High School named Lynn Bias. And what I saw that night changed my whole focus on Maryland basketball. He was amazing that night, and I believe the Capitol All-Stars beat the U.S. All-Stars that night. Tony and Walt are Turks, and this book describes how they wanted to be a Turp. Like Lenny and how they became Turps, and what life's journeys brought to them, all with number 34 in mind. For any sports fan, and especially a Maryland basketball fan, this is an incredible memory-filled book chronicalizing events that shaped basketball in the DMV. May I present Tony Massenberg and Walt Williams. Go Terps. <laughs> This is Walt, I'm Tony. <laughs> um, very long time ago, um, I was in high school, like us all, and obviously I played basketball, and most guys in high school have a favorite basketball player. I had a couple, but there was one that really stood out and really shaped who I would become as a basketball player. Uh, my childhood idol was Dr. J, Julius Irving. I grew up watching him. Um, he played for the Virginia Squires, and. and in the ABA and eventually went on to play for the Sixers and we all know who he was. And that was my first introduction to the game, watching him. Um, as I grew older into my teenage years, uh, by my sophomore year, um, I became enamored with this guy at the University of Maryland whose name was Len Bias. And uh, as a high schooler, um, there was only one place that I wanted to go play college basketball if I had the opportunity, that was the University of Maryland. Um, so to have that opportunity was huge for me. So I'm jumping ahead of myself just a little bit. Let me give you a little bit of background about my NBA career because I was fortunate enough to go on to play in the NBA. I played uh, 15 years professionally, 13 in the NBA for 12 different teams. And uh, during that entire time, I was always inspired by this guy named Lynn Bias. So let me go back to that now just to give you guys a little bit of background. So. Um, I get the opportunity to go to the University of Maryland and to play with my idol because that's what Lynn Bias was to me. He wasn't just a, another good basketball player in, the, in, the, in college basketball. He was the best basketball player in college. And I had the opportunity to go and learn from a guy that I idolized all through high school and, and just wanted to be like in every way. I wanted to run like him and jump like him and shoot the basketball like him. Wanted to be Lynn Bias. And so for me, it was like uh, Lynn Bias to me as a basketball player uh, was what Michael Jordan was to Kobe Bryant. Everybody knows Kobe Bryant and understands that Kobe patterned himself after Mike. So I wanted to have an opportunity to learn from the guy that I idolized the most at that time as a high schooler, which was Lynn Bias. So I get my opportunity to go to University of Maryland. And again, it was a dream. Just imagine being 17 years old, being able to play with the person you idolize the most with the sport that you love. And to play at a university that you wanted uh, to go to, ultimately, was the University of Maryland. So growing up in Southern Virginia, uh, right outside of Richmond, you have a lot of UVA and you know, Virginia Tech and even a lot of North Carolina fans because where I grew up is as far south in Virginia and right on the North Carolina border. So everybody in my hometown is either North Carolina fans or UVA fans or or Virginia Tech fans, and I was one of the only Maryland fans. So for me, as a Virginia guy who loved Maryland and loved Lynn Bias, um, it was just a dream come true to be able to play with him my freshman year. So I complete my freshman year, it's awesome. We go to the NCAAs, 
I get an opportunity to really learn what made Len Bias the basketball player that he was. His work ethic, um, he was a great big brother, a mentor, because you gotta remember, we're all adults now, and we all are old enough to know that sometimes when you meet people that you idolize, <laughs> you end up wishing that you didn't because it changes your perspective on how they were. And for me, as a 17-year-old, um, going to the University of Maryland and having Lenny as the guy that I idolized and having him be a great guy that would take me under his wing and try to teach me the things that enabled him to be so good. So he was not one of those horror stories where you meet your idol and you're like, oh my God, they're, you know, they're not what I thought they were. He was everything that I thought he was as a person and as a basketball player, he taught me the things that made him great. And it really came down to, um, Lynn Bias had a lot of God-given ability. He was a great athlete, he could run and jump as good as anybody that we've ever seen. But what people don't understand is that the work ethic combined with that talent is what made him who he was. He worked really, really hard on his game and to build his body, to be strong, and to be able to do drills and shoot the way that he did. So I learned that the work ethic is what makes you. And so uh, I have my year to play with Lynn, and obviously he gets drafted. He's the best player in the country, and he gets drafted. Um, second pick in the draft. And then ultimately we know what happens. For less than 48 hours, he dies uh, of an apparent drug overdose. And so uh, for me, obviously being devastated at that point and having to now make a decision because of the chaos that's sort of ensuing the program. And uh, my love for Marilyn and my love for Lynn is what kept me there. And basically uh, when we talk about, uh, we call this book Lessons from Lenny is because the things that I learned there enabled me to persevere. And a lot of times in life when you're trying to achieve something, you hit bumps in the road. Well, this was a huge hurdle for me. But ultimately, the things that I went through uh, enabled me to endure it. And so me choosing to stay at the University of Maryland um, was my own decision, just like it was my decision to come there. And so I ultimately decided to stay because I felt that I could still be successful despite the things that was going on. And so uh, into my, going into my junior year, um, we have this really good recruit um, from Crossland High School coming in. His name is Walt Williams. <laughs> and so uh, once he gets there as a freshman, I'm a junior. And it was there that I learned of his love for Lynn Bias and the motivation for him wanting to come to the University of Maryland as a guy who was 16 years old at the time when Lynn Bias died. So I'll let Walt tell you a little bit about his inspiration on Lynn Bias. Well, yeah, just, just uh, like Tony just mentioned, I am a little bit younger than he is. You know? <laughs> so, he uh, likes to throw that at me all the time. <laughs> Trust me, I, 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 I know that. <laughs> I am a little jealous because I did not have the opportunity to uh, play with Lynn Bias. He was definitely an idol of mine. I looked at him as an icon. Um, at this time, for me, I was a junior in high school when, the, when this tragedy happened. And, uh, you know, growing up, I w I'm a kid from uh, Prince George's County, uh, the same place where Lynn Bias is from. Um, as a matter of fact, his high school, I played against his younger brother throughout my whole high school career. So we, were, we grew up in very close proximity. And so uh, in our area, we were uh, big Georgetown Hoya fans in those days, you know, John Thompson. And uh, so we were big Georgetown Hoya fans, and, and I was no different. And uh, I was maybe like 14 years old when my dad took me to a Maryland, North Carolina game. And I had the opportunity to see Lynn Bias in person. And uh, up until that point, I would watch highlights of, of the Terps and I would see him and Adrian Branch and those guys. And I definitely uh, uh, was a, a fan of those guys. But when I saw Lynn Bias in person, it was, it was different for me. Um, I had a feeling where I was forever a Terp fan from that point on. I found myself watching them more than the Hoyas from that point on. And so uh, I started to see that, uh, man, I, was, I started to grow, uh, the, the infatuation started to get bigger and bigger for me. Uh, growing up in my neighborhood, we would always play pickup games where you never see kids do that anymore nowadays. But we would play pickup games on the playgrounds or what have you. And, 
Uh, we were always the first guy to yell out a name of, of a professional player or a college player. You would pretend to be that person for that day. And I would always be first to say, I'm Lynn Bias for the day. And uh, that had a, a lasting impression on me because uh, in high school, I did not have dreams of being an NBA player. I didn't even know that that was reality. Um, I thought that that happened to people from somewhere else, you know. And, um, and so my dream was to be Lynn Bias. My dream was to have players, uh, little kids, grow up in the community and play on the playgrounds and pretend to be me like we did Lynn Bias. And so uh, uh, that was my dream, and that's what I sought after. And, uh, and so that's what led me to go to the University of Maryland, and that was the biggest, the biggest reason why I did. And, and um, uh, also, I'm from that area, so it's huge. And, and, and the DMV is a great breeding ground for basketball players, but, but even if you, if you zone in just on Prince George's County, just that small county, um, it's always been an abundance of players there that, that make it to the NBA. I, right now, it's probably almost 20 guys in the NBA right now just from PG County, not including the, the whole DMV, but just that small county. And so uh, it, it was a lot of pride to have a guy like Lynn Bias to be a number two pick. He was the number two pick in the 1986 draft to the Boston Celtics. Uh, he was a two-time ACC Player of the Year, Athlete of the Year. Um, so uh, uh, he was looked at as uh, a guy who would battle Michael Jordan, sort of that next era of Magic Johnson, Larry Bird type of clash. They looked at him in that light. Uh, the Boston Celtics was a team that was in championship games constantly with the, with the Lakers. And, and the NBA thought that that would continue with the draft of Boston, uh, uh, Lynn Bias to the Boston Celtics. Unfortunately, it didn't. But all of these things played into uh, why I chose the University of Maryland and why I wanted to follow in his footsteps. And uh, it was huge for me. I, I can say maybe like uh, five, six years ago was probably the first times that I could really even talk about it. You know, it affected me in that much without, you know, breaking down. He was, uh, he was everything to me. Uh, Tony talked about Dr. J being his idol. Um, I love George Gervin, the Iceman. And that was my first introduction mm -hmm. to a guy I zoned in on as a basketball player. But then, like I said, I saw Lynn Bias and uh, he, he changed things because he was from where I, where I was from. He was the first person that showed me that uh, going to the NBA could be a reality. And so he opened up my eyes in a lot of different ways. And so that's why, uh, once again, it was a lot of different factors and why I chose the University of Maryland other than I couldn't leave my mom, you know, mama's boy, I couldn't leave her. <laughs> but uh, Lynn Bias had a big part to play in that. I want to read you guys um, a quote from Coach Gary Williams that's on the back of our book just to give you a little bit more uh, insight on Walt and I's careers at the University of Maryland. Goes like this, quote, Maryland needed student athletes like Tony Massenberg, number 25, and Walt Williams, number 42, to survive devastating circumstances. They were leaders on my first team, and no team of mine fought harder. Nobody played with more purpose. That determination sets a tone as we work our way into a championship program. It all started with that first team. Now, that, the team that Gary Williams is referring to is the team from my senior year. And I'm sorry, from, yeah, from my senior year and Walt's uh, sophomore year. And uh, that team had, for me personally, Gary Williams was my third coach by the time I was a senior. So uh, because of the things that were happening at Maryland, um, Bob Wade was hired after Lefty Drizelle was ultimately fired um, my freshman year, and he coached the team for three years. So I played two years under Bob, one year under Lefty, and one year under Gary. And I sat out the first year in 1986 that Bob Wade coached the team. So that's how I got five years and three coaches at the same university. Now, the entire time that I was there, um, Lynn Bias dominated my thoughts. Um, it wasn't easy for me to try to work myself into a better player playing in th for three different coaches, as you can imagine. Three different systems, uh, three different philosophies at a pretty tumultuous time. 
but it was my love for the university and Lynn Bias that kept me there and, and persevered and, and guys like Walt coming in and having the interest uh, in Lynn Bias and wanting to know everything that I knew uh, that Lenny had taught me. So it was my junior year that I realized that Lynn Bias's legacy not just could live on, but would live on through guys like Walt because he would ask me things. They would take the time. Walt and I would sometimes sit in Cole Field House and we'd just talk about Lynn Bias we, in Maryland basketball and, and how we wanted to get the program back to prominence and get it back to a place of respectability because we lost a little bit of that just on the, the tragedy itself. And so um, we both ultimately go on to be drafted into the NBA. Um, I was drafted in 1990, Walt came out in 1992. And what a lot of people don't know is that we decided that we would mentor the guys from the University of Maryland as pros. We both moved on to the NBA and we decided that, you know what, we're going to come back to the University of Maryland. We're not going to go to California or Texas or Florida where a lot of guys, NBA guys, congregate to work out in the summer. We arranged summer workouts on the University of Maryland campus with all the local pros, guys that played for the Wizards and guys that were from the area that were playing in the NBA. So there were times that we'd have the majority of the summers, we would have anywhere from 15 to sometimes 20 pro basketball players in the gym and we decided that we wanted to bring the University of Maryland basketball team in with us to play with pros because we sat those guys down and we told them we say listen if you guys want to get better you need to play with play against people who are better than you meaning pros that's how you improve and so um, when we talk about that championship team in particular we did it for years but with that championship team I think they really took the lessons that we were trying to teach. And that team uh, featured guys like Juan Dixon, Lonnie Baxter, uh, Chris Wilcox, Steve Blake, these guys. Uh, Steve Francis was also in there. Um, th there are so many guys that I could continue to name. Some of the names escape me because there have been so many great basketball players. But all these guys recognized that Walt and I organizing these pickup games would be beneficial. Um, and so ultimately the team uh, from the teachings and the lessons that we were trying to put down to them, ultimately these guys go on to win a championship, a national championship in 2002. I was playing for the Memphis Grizzlies at the time, and the championship game against Indiana was being played in Atlanta. So I just happened to have a day off from practice when the championship, on the day that the championship game was being played. So I took a short flight from Memphis to Atlanta and was able to join the team uh, for the game and as a result, we all know that we end up winning, and that was a huge uh, crowning moment for the University of Maryland. Woo. So let's, let's get a little round of applause for that. <laughs> because uh, even though I wasn't on that championship team, I felt a part of it, Absolutely. and Walt felt a part of it because we were so entrenched and so invested uh, emotionally with these guys because we had a goal. That was what him and I used to talk about uh, when we were sitting in Cold Field House, like what we can do to get this, get our program back to prominence, and not just prominence, but championship level. And certainly it took a lot of years, and it took us being almost, I think at that time, what, 10 years in the league yeah, at that yeah, point? Yeah. So for us, uh, we were 10-year NBA veterans, and we're coming back playing with all the current players at that time at the University of Maryland. And to see them go on and not just uh, win the ACC, but win a national championship and knowing that we had our hand in that, that really was the moment um, that we s sort of realized like, hey, this is really good what we're doing. And so uh, this book, when we start to talk about um, the lessons from Lenny, it's basically a story of triumph over tragedy and turning a negative into a positive and using the lessons that you learn from something that was so painful as a way to shape you and make you a better person. And ultimately for me, um, it's a cautionary tale because the biggest lesson that we learn from this is that one decision at a time when you think you've achieved everything that you, you've worked for, achieved your dreams, can alter your future forever. And that's the biggest lesson. 
the thing that we were proud about when we talk about the program winning the national championship is that we overcame all the odds and the circumstances, the things that Walt and I sometimes had to endure, uh, particularly myself, when you're talking about being there right in the aftermath of his death, and Walt still feeling it coming in two years later and having to deal with some things. So uh, Lynn Bias was very inspirational for us, and that inspiration is something that we tried to pass on to a younger generation and was ultimately successful. And now we're seeing even younger generations uh, starting to take note of the story before we even wrote this book. So that's part of what inspired us to write it because we realized um, not just from an athletic standpoint but from a legislative standpoint there were laws that were changed because of what happened with Lynn Bias. And a lot of people don't know that. We go into that. There's actually a thing called the Lynn Bias Law where um, if I am a drug dealer and I sell you drugs and you OD on those drugs, you can now be prosecuted uh, for murder. And that's part of the laws. We talk about mass incarceration and some changes and, and, uh, that have been happening with, with drugs and the difference between cocaine and crack. That started with this because Congress had to go into action because something happened really bad in their backyard and they wanted to try to make an imprint on the war on drugs. And so you look at that and you talk about not just an impact, not just the impact that Lenny had on the University of Maryland, but the impact that would resonated across the country when you talk about legislative change and the magnitude of the story, because everybody knew this story. And so uh, we use all of that to flip it around and put the story back out to people as something that you can learn from and persevere. And uh, nobody is doing that better than his mother, Lenise Bias, who has been a big time speaker an advocate for gun violence and the war on drugs. So there's a lot of inspiration that came from Lynn Bias, and Walt and I are just two guys who were in a position who were at the University of Maryland, who went on to play in the NBA, to be able to tell the story and put it back out there to people so that people understand that there was more to Lynn Bias than just the way he died. He was an inspirational figure, a great big brother, and a guy that not just Walt and I admired, but a lot of the guys who would come to the University of Maryland were also huge Lynn Bias fans. Yeah, uh, for me, I think an inspiration for me in writing this book was, uh, uh, it's a quote from Lefty in this book that says, uh, one mistake does not uh, take away a lifetime of greatness. And uh, that, that really inspired me, uh, that, that, that quote there. Um, many know about the tragedy surrounding Lynn's death but few know the impact that he had on the community. He was more than just that. And uh, we wanted the opportunity to, to explain that and talk about his impact, the profound impact, the positive impact he had on our lives personally, on our communities, uh, on the University of Maryland. Uh, and, and just like t Tony said, laws that were, were passed because of this, this situation, we wanted to touch upon that. Um, more importantly, uh, just the community. This guy meant so much to us, and we wanted everyone to know what he meant to us. He was more than just the tragedy surrounding his death, and we wanted people to know about that. Um, he, like I mentioned earlier about the inspiration he gave kids, uh, just opening up the, the, uh, uh, the, the narrative of that you can dream, and then you can, you can do that. You can, you can live out your dreams. Those things became reality because of him, and we wanted to touch upon those things. Um, also, for me personally, I mean, this book is, is more than just basketball. It's about grief. It's about survival, loyalty, perseverance, all of the things that we needed to overcome. It forced the university to look within to find out what, what went wrong, and we became a better, a better university for that. Uh, academically, I can sp I point to specifically, you see the graduation rates of student athletes start to get way better than it was because it forced us to look at what was going on there. Um, we have a similar situation going on now where you're talking about a football player in Jordan McNair who passed away, senselessly passed away, and once again, it forces the university to look within. We gotta get better, we gotta get better from this, and we gotta learn from the mistakes that we made and we, we got to perform. We got to be better so that this never happens again. We've shown in the past that we can do that. 
and it took a lot of, it feels uh, prideful in this university to know we can come back from a tragedy like that. I don't know how many university, university that can do that and come back to prominence and become a championship uh, 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 university. We showed that we could do that. And once again, we felt like this was uh, something that uh, could open that, that forum again and, and kind of uh, provide a blueprint into how you do this again. And uh, hopefully this time it we would never have to go. It's, circumstances are certainly different, but uh, it, uh, but it, eerily, it is similar as well. And so we felt like this book can give a, a, an a open form to, to how you rebound from that. Uh, personally, as th those players going through that, um, high school recruits making decisions about coming into the university, um, that was something that I felt like w was unique to the book. We're talking about the same topic, but from two different perspectives. Tony was a guy who played there, who was there, entrenched in the situation, and then how do you, you respond from that. I was an impressionable high school kid trying to make decisions on what I was going to do as, in terms of um, what university I was going to pick. And you all know, those are probably, at, at that time, that's the most important time of your life, what university you're going to pick. And so I was in those moments. And so it gives, uh, it gives, it sheds a light on my mindset and what I was thinking about and, and those things. So it gives two different per perspectives on the same topic. And so I thought that that was a unique thing that we were able to cover a lot of ground on that. And so uh, that was a lot of the, the inspiration for writing the book. Uh, I don't want to talk too much. I want to give you guys opportunities to, to ask questions. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. We both graduated too, by the way. We didn't just Absolutely. hang around. We actually we did graduate. <laughs> and as Walt said, from an academic standpoint, when you look at the University of Maryland now, the standards have been raised. And um, the head uh, person in our, at our archives, uh, Ms. Turcos, she also had a quote uh, in this book. And she said that had it not been for what happened at the University of Maryland, the University of Maryland would not be what it is today. If it had not been for the tragedy with Lynn Bias losing his life, and as Walt said, forcing the university to look within and raise its standards, basically, it's like having a scar on your face, a big scar. You can put a big Band-Aid over it, but when people see you, the first thing they notice is that bandage, and they're like, well, what's underneath that bandage? Well, you take that bandage off sometimes, you gotta let that scar, let everybody see that scar and let it heal. And it took a long time for the University of Maryland to heal, but it did. And for me, um, as a guy that went through it, um, certainly I bared some scars from that emotionally, and I still do, but I was able to heal. And this book helped me do that. Um, I ultimately won a championship going back to my pro career. Um, I was drafted by the San Antonio Spurs out of University of Maryland in 1990, and I ended up back with the Spurs in 2005, and I won a national championship with them wearing the number 34 as I had worn at previous times throughout my career because that's how much of an inspiration Lynn Bias was to me. The only reason that I didn't wear 34 more was because I would play on teams sometimes where the number wasn't available. But whenever the number was available, I wore it be, along with 44, which was my, those were my two numbers as a pro. But whenever I could get an opportunity to wear that 34, I did. And I think it's ironic, I only got to war, wear it uh, twice in my career and the second time I wore it, I, wore, I won a national championship. And so after that national championship uh, with the Spurs, world championship rather, um, I was going to retire that, that number because I felt like my inspiration, you know, I had a goal in mind. I wanted to win a championship wearing that jersey, and I achieved that. So um, for us, even as longtime pros, I played 15 years, Walt played 12 years. Yes. And the entire time as grown men, we were still inspired by Lynn Bias. That's what was driving us to go back to the University of Maryland and continue to tutor those guys. So um, when we talk about Lenny, um, as Walt said, it's so much bigger than basketball. It's really about life. It's how we raise our kids. It's the lessons that we learn and that have enabled us to, to be able to put it on the pages and tell it to a younger generation. Um, question was, was Tom McMillan um, in our conference? Uh, Con Congress, in Congress. Congress. Yes, I uh, believe he was. I believe actually. he was, actually, yes. yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Um, I believe he was in Congress. I don't know how much effect he had on the law, but I do yes. believe he was in Congress at that time. Yeah. Um, essentially, uh, when you talk about Lefty being let go, that was just a byproduct of trying to heal um, the way that we did it. Because, again, a situation like that, you know, when you talk about a, a tragedy on that level at a major university, 99 out of 100 universities are going to clean house. Absolutely. And that's what happened to Lefty Giselle. He, he was fired because of the tragedy, not because it was his fault. Uh, so was Dick Dahl, the athletic director, and ultimately the chancellor, Chancellor yes. Slaughter, yes. would leave the following year. So you're talking about a completely different administration um, and just an overall shift in the mentality. And again, had it not been for Lynn Bias, that was the beginning of what would now, what we now know as the University of Maryland. It started with Lefty Drizel and Dick Dull and those guys in the athletic department basically cleaning house. Again, not because it was their fault, but because it was what was needed to be done in order for the healing process to start. It, it's virtually impossible for a coach to uh, pay attention or be involved in every aspect of a, a student athlete's life. And so there are moments where they're doing their own thing and, and coaches are not aware. But at the end of the day, it's just like anything, a CEO or whatever. If you're in charge, then you're responsible for, for what happens there. And so, you know, like, like Tony said, a lot of people, they cleared house because, of, I mean, the circumstances. With, you know, you, you got to expect that something like that would just happen. On, just on accountability alone. Absolutely. And we all, as adults, we know how that is. You will be held accountable. Yes. Um, I just want to say thank you for being here, and um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I'm just um, wondering what you guys are up to now, and also, Walt, do you wear, still wear knee-high socks? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually do wear knee-high socks. I don't have them on today a little bit. It's a little hot. <laughs> but I do, man. It was all, it was not, for me, it wasn't like a fashion statement or anything like that. It was, it was comfort, comfortability for me. Um, it started actually from watching uh, George Gervin highlights, and I noticed that he had the high socks in those highlights. And so uh, I remember this one intra-scar scrimmage game we had uh, against each other, red against white. And it was right after a football game, so we had a lot of people in the stands. And I played incredible in that. That was the first time I pulled my socks up, and I played incredible in that scrimmage. And so I felt like it was because of the socks. <laughs> and we went with that ever since. <laughs> yeah, keep them high. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I, I'm a financial advisor now. I'm also um, um, on the board for Blue Cross Blue Shield in the state of Maryland. And uh, um, I have a scholarship fund at the University of Maryland as well. So do a lot of different things. I work for, I currently work for NBC, I uh, cover the Wizards, and I also work for Monumental Sports. I cover their G League team, also the Go-Go, where I do play-by-play -play for them. A lot of people don't know about the G League, but the G League is the basically the uh, farm system for the Wizards to call up players. Just like in baseball, baseball has their, their what is it, AAA, I think they call it, where they call up guys when there's injuries to players on the big club then they, they pull from their minor league club. So the G League is basically um, the minor leagues for the Wizards and other NBA teams. Every NBA team has a G League affiliate. And, so. and I also hang out with uh, Johnny Holiday and Chris Naki from you time go. to time on the home games on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yes. So do you still live in Prince George's County? I do not live in Montgomery oh, County well, now. I'm a Prince George's yeah. County girl too, but I live in Montgomery County now. Yeah. I live in Montgomery County now. Right there. Right there. I just want to say congratulations to you as well. Thank uh, you. Especially congratulations from my dad, who has passed away in 2002. Oh. My dad was a coach and icon. Oh, right. uh, coach Ed Martin, oh, right. uh, Coach John Thompson said my dad was his mentor. Oh, right. um, okay. But I'm sure he would be so proud of you because he once had a big man camp uh, with a oh, lot of yeah. NBA players. He coached about 18 of them, too tall, Truck mm -hmm. Robertson. Oh, um, right. Ted, the Hal McLean. Um, right. I talk to them all the time. <laughs> but I just hope that this catapults you to write more books about other players because these children today really need to hear these stories. Yeah. It gives them, gives them credence for who they are. 
and I'm, I'm just so proud of you, and I'm sure my dad would be too. And Thank I hope you. one day to get my dad's story out there. Right. But Thank he's, you. He's Thank in eight you. Hall of Fames of sports and basketball now, so okay. right. even right. posthumously. So. Awesome. That's <laughs> no, so nice to meet you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I actually did coach the Wizards um, for a year in 2008-2009, and um, I was under uh, Coach Eddie Jordan. Ultimately, he got fired, and so um, I was able to continue coaching the rest of the year, but the following season I moved to, to being an analyst for NBC, and I've been doing that pretty much ever since. Yeah, I've, I've coached high school for a few years. Um, my son transferred, so I was missing a lot of his games, so I had to stop that for a while. And so he's just finishing up. Uh, right now, I coach with an AAU program, a ninth grade team with uh, Byron Mouton's program, uh, University of Maryland alum as well. And so, you know, I always keep my hand, like I do the radio with uh, Johnny, Johnny Holiday and, and Chris Naki. So I'm up front there watching the game. So I keep my hand in, in that basketball world. So who knows, who knows what will happen down in the future. I also wanted to uh, just, you know, say kudos to you guys for um, successful careers and for all the work you've done and for writing this book. But the question I have uh, for Walt, uh, you made a comment. I thought I heard you say that uh, kids today don't play in pickup games. Yes. And I was curious. But I wasn't aware of that. What's what's up with that? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, these kids nowadays, their only interaction in basketball is when they go to practice. So I feel like a lot of things are lost in translation um, because uh, the kids play the game with, all, with someone always giving them direction. Um, I think that takes the fun out of who wants to hear someone telling them st about their mistakes all the time. You know, sometimes you got to get out there and just play for fun. And what these kids don't realize is when you're going out there and you're playing a pickup game, there's no adults, there's no coaches telling you what to do. And so you're, you're out there enjoying the game for yourself. Also, what goes along with that is a, 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 a maturity in the game, a learning curve in the game, because when you're out there, you have to figure out, okay, this type of player is playing on this team this type of this guy on my team can guard this guy or what have you you have to figure those things out as a player and then when you go into an organized situation where coaches are coaching you you learn things a lot quicker you you have a natural feel out there and a lot of that is lost and so it puts a lot of onus on the coaches to teach these kids nowadays everything you know, in the game. And so a lot of things are lost in translation because of uh, the absence it, of pickup it, games. Essentially, well, it's, like, um, it's like riding a bicycle with training wheels. You know, when kids play pickup games, it's like taking the training wheels off the bike because now you don't have somebody telling you, you know, pedal this way, hold a handlebar, like, you know, get on balance. They learn more when the adults aren't around. Like, prime example, when we had the – those University of Maryland basketball teams playing with us, um, we would mentor them individually sometimes. But what we figured out was that they were going back to the dorm and they were talking amongst themselves. Because, um, and, and a lot of times they would come up and they would tell us, like there would be different guys uh, that they may play against and they'd be like, wow, I didn't know that that guy was this good or I didn't know that this guy was that strong or I didn't know that this guy was that quick. Well, when you have the opportunity to figure it out on your own, you also make the adjustments and the lessons stick a little bit more in your head when you've actually experienced it yourself versus somebody telling you that, hey, that guy's quick or, hey, that guy's strong. Like, so that's what we're talking about. Kids don't really play pickup games. We play pickup games three, four times a day. I mean, we wake up in the morning. We'd play by 9, 10 o'clock sometimes. We'd, be, we'd break, go get something to eat. We'd be back playing at 1. We'd play in for a couple of hours. We'd break. We'd come back and play again at 6. And then sometimes we end up playing again at, you know, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And a lot of people don't understand, like, it's the reputation is what makes you good. And you can get all the workout coaches in the world. That's the big thing now, right, Walt? Yeah, yeah. Everybody has a workout coach. Well, you know, we were each other's workout coaches. Yes. So, and that's a, a little cheaper. bit of what's changed. <laughs> yeah, a lot of cheating, no question. <laughs> no, I would say it's a lot cheaper to go that oh, route. Oh, a lot cheaper, out. yeah, yeah, <laughs> and some cheating. <laughs> yes, sir. There you go. No <laughs> Jim, there you go. Congratulations to both of you, uh, you for your basketball success, but also for completing your degree. 
Thank you. Um, I, I think you're, you're generally exceptions uh, to the rule in terms of Division I athletes, particularly basketball, football players, et cetera. Do you think enough is done for the athletes to support them academically so that more athletes can complete their degrees and be successes? It seems that a lot of kids use their eligibility and then they don't finish their degree and just don't succeed as, as you have post-career. Yeah, I, I think I think rules can be changed in terms of uh, you know uh, um, the university has the option of when, when a, a a kid leaves the university if he has not graduated the university has the option of whether they can continue their education and I, I think that should be something that's mandatory where they they can uh, that 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 scholarship is there for them to complete their their. Um, a scholarship, I mean, to, to get a, a degree there, whether they're continuing to play basketball or not. I think it's important that once you get into that college environment, it's just so many doors are open and it's important to finish. So uh, you, you make a great point there. Yeah, uh, I 100% agree with everything that Walt just said, and I'll just add this. Um, people sometimes like to get up in arms when uh, they look at the graduation rates at universities or or guys going into the league early knowing that they didn't graduate from college. And I get that. But I think what people don't understand is that just being a student at a major university is not easy um, to make that adjustment to the academic curriculum and, and the scheduling and, and just being on your own in general as a 17 or 18 year old. Um, obviously you get better as the years go on, you get into your sophomore and junior year. But it's not easy to just be a student. When you throw in three to four hours of practice time that you have to obligate and beat your body up and fatigue yourself, you know, totally to the point where you can barely walk out of the gym and now you have to go home and study or go to a study hall, you know, that's not easy. And so I think people don't understand that it requires a lot of mental fortitude and, and just uh, toughness to really graduate while at the same time playing football or basketball and giving up the time commitments. Regular students don't have to do that. And, and you know, yeah, sure, students have part-time jobs or whatever, but they're not playing basketball or football a lot of the times. And so physically, it's not the same toll on your body, and mentally, it's not the same toll. So um, I think that there needs to be a little bit more compassion towards student athletes because the plight is different. You're not just an average student on campus. You have requirements and, and, and restrictions that other students don't have. And so sometimes trying to balance that is the reason why you don't see people graduating. It's not because they're not, they don't want to graduate. Everybody comes to school, they want to graduate. But there are a lot of times when you sign your scholarship, you got that scholarship because of your ability to play the game. So. While we say that we come to universities to get an education, and we do, the reason why Walt and I ended up at the University of Maryland is because we were great basketball players in high school. And so you can't, I think that you can't just push that off to the side and just act like it's all about school and if you, know, you struggle, then it's because you're either not very smart or you're not very motivated. So I think that's something that the NCAA needs to take into consideration, especially um, when guys do leave early or don't complete um, their graduation in four years. You should always have the option to come back and finish. And not only that, uh, you know, Tony didn't mention this part of it, the travel. When you're going to games, oftentimes you're going to miss school and exactly. you have to make up for that. But also, the criteria to get into a university is different for an athlete than the normal student. If you look at the grade point average and the SAT scores that you have to have as a, a regular student, it's, it's very high. But as an athlete, it's not. And so, uh, that can lend to uh, you, your learning curve not being the same uh, or uh, the education that you receive not being on the same level and those type of things. And so do you factor in that you don't have the same time uh, to work on your academics like uh, the regular students? So that even adds to it even more that you've got to do more work in order to overcome those things um, with those obstacles in the way. And so oftentimes it takes a little bit more time for the athlete to complete uh, his degree. Right, Any more man. questions? Hey, this was awesome right, right here. Thank you Thank so you much. guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you guys' support. Absolutely.